cluster telecon for 21 February. Uh, I have on the agenda, which you can get a link to from the chat in the go to meeting bottom window. Uh, it's a Google doc and it has some of the details, uh, all of the details of today's meeting and, uh, Volunteers for note taking. I'll take notes or between myself and Bruce. We will. You're also welcome to just type your name into anywhere here in under the attendees. Uh, link line number two under meeting agenda is a link to the speaker series past events. And that's basically an ESIP wiki document that has uh, each of the last four or five uh, talks that we've had uh, with an abstract and then a link to a YouTube video which seems to be, to be the way that we're now uh, moving towards, as Bruce was just uh, referring to, asynchronous uh, talks. Uh, as far as keeping this thing going, I have Yolanda Gill of USC for March, third Wednesday. I have uh, Rick Almendinger of Cornell for April. And now we're, and we're looking to, uh, to populate May and June. We'll, take off uh, July and possibly August, July because of the ESIP summer meeting in August just for vacation. There's, and, uh, but we're always looking for more speaker ideas here. Um, I've asked uh, Sky Bristol to either talk or at, help me find some more people. Uh, so you're welcome to email me at any time with ideas you have uh, and or get or get people committed and we'll just go with it. So um, any questions about that? All right, so without much further ado, then I just want to move into the talk uh, by Steve Richard, who's an adjunct uh, research scientist at Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. I've put his bio in here, and um, basically, I guess the key point here is that he's now, uh, Steve, you're retired and you're working as an adjunct research scientist. So um, I guess you have the best of both worlds, right? <laughs> ah, we shall see. <laughs> so uh, his talk is on adventures in software development for geoscience data entry and discovery, and um, we're going to turn it over to him. All right. Thanks, Jim. Um, well, today I was going to, um, let's see, let's get, there we go. Um, really, this is more of a retrospective on projects that I've worked on in the past, um, and really kind of reviewing how the outcomes of those projects worked out and, and trying to think a little bit about what worked and what didn't work in terms of developing software for science information. And uh, the sort of bottom line takeaway is that successful software projects require a lot more than good technology. And, and uh, it's probably not news to anybody, but I think I thought it was something that would be worth reiterating with some concrete examples. Anyway, uh, the plan here is I'm, I'm going to talk about three projects I've worked on in the past and the outcomes from those projects and, and some of the lessons learned and then sort of finish with a, um, a proposed framework for, you know, how things seem to be going now and, and the direction that software development might be moving in. So I'll dive right in there. So the three systems I'm going to talk about are, are the a geologic information system that was developed um, for the National Geologic Map Database. Um, this was back starting in, in uh, about 2000 or so, um, dealing with a wide variety of geolo geologists with all kinds of different interests, requirements, and approaches. So it required a great deal of scope in terms of the kind of content that we wanted to account for. Um, so we developed a schema-driven data entry system, and this was a software development project that we started from scratch. So basically, it was a, a C++ developed environment with a collection of forms and stuff. The second project was uh, evolving from that National Geologic Map Database project at the Arizona Geologic Survey, developing tools within an ArcGIS environment to actually automate the data that we were collecting from the geologic mapping projects in the field. So it's the production workflows for, for geologic data going from the field to a, to a finished geologic map and database. And then the final, the final set of projects involved catalog systems. So trying to improve the discoverability and accessibility of data from um, 
state geologic surveys and academic institutions and from all over by, by building metadata collection and aggregation systems and trying to standardize that. Um, and this was developed using a variety of, of open source projects over a number of years. So all of these projects are, are user interface focused. Um, and the, the uh, one thing to bear in mind is that the, the business logic is mostly involves validation and, and moving data in and out of databases. It, these are not big number crunching projects. They are involved with manipulating data, um, collecting metadata and validating data and metadata for delivery. And really this was done, all this, this work was done mostly in the context of, of state and federal geologic surveys where the goal is data stewardship and delivery. So really the focus was on trying to make information available for people to use um, for both research and for practical applications. So um, the National Geologic Map Database was a, a collaboration between the U.S. Geologic Survey and the Association of American State Geologists. And the basic motivation was, you know, isn't, there's got to be some way we can reduce duplication of effort and wasted time by sharing database design, vocabulary, and tools across all these different agencies and um, organizations that are out making geologic maps and collecting geologic data. Um, the really, you know, thinking about what's in a geologic map, we have a fairly complicated information artifact here. There's um, looking on, on the right hand side, we see, you know, if you sort of think about, okay, how do we capture all the information here in a database? There's sort of the overall map layout, um, which is an aggregation of different portrayals of what you might call map, to, you know, the map itself, but there's also cross sections, which are essentially little maps. And there's also a series of other graphics here that represent stratigraphic relationships geologic setting, maybe other things. So there's a whole set of, of maps that are actually arranged in this layout. And each one of those maps portrays a collection of information of observation occurrences that are represented by feature classes in the database. So the spatial objects, points, lines, and polygons. So it's a, it's a, it's a pretty complicated information structure. And each geologist does things a little bit differently. And there are all kinds of different maps that are focused on different aspects of the earth and the earth being what it is, those, those different focuses can result in pretty different products. So this project was done, um, we were using the ESRI ArcGIS software because that's, that was what most geologic surveys are using or all geologic surveys, except for maybe one or two are using for, for doing their geologic map. Um, digital geologic map work. Um, we came up with a fairly sophisticated database design that allowed a great deal of representational flexibility. But as you can see, just you know, looking at the number of tables and relationships and things here, it, it's pretty complicated. So in order to account for all the different requirements that we were trying to address, we, had, we developed a, a, the, a design that allowed for the schema to be defined in the database so that you could customize the kind of entities that were being represented and the properties that were associated with those entities and then spin up the database, um, the user interface from that schema definition table. And so the, the schema definition had to include sort of the definitions of the entities and properties, the domains, what vocabularies were being used. So there was a bunch of vocabulary development and then also layout hints for what kind of controls to use in the user interface for different the different properties. And, uh, you know, there ended up in the database, there was a whole set of tables that were just about the entities and the properties and the definitions of, this, of the schema that were used to generate the user interface. So from the point of view of the user, this is what we came up with after there was a, a couple man years of development work went into this. So it was done by John Craig. Um, Dave Soller was the, was the supervisor on this project. He's at, at the the National Geologic Map Database Project at the USGS. Most of the, but uh, John Craig here in Tucson did most of the development work. So, so I'm just gonna look at a couple of the different kinds of user interfaces that we developed for this. So the geologic units, we tried to capture the idea that there are geologic units, but then from the point of view of the field geologist, you have descriptions of geologic units in lots of different places. So, if in this tree view for the geologic units, the base nodes are different geologic units, 
But then underneath that, there's a bunch of child nodes that are different descriptions of that unit at different outcrops in different places. So each description has a context and a given geologic unit can have a lot of different descriptions. So when you come back from the field, typically what we have would be a bunch of notes from different outcrop locations that are related to the different geologic units. And the job we have in compiling the map is to assemble all those descriptions into a group of units that we're going to show on the map and a consistent description for each unit. So in this view, then, the right side shows the details at the geologic unit level. So all the, the properties that are in common across all the, all the descriptions. And then if you want to deal with a specific description at a specific location, you can select it for edit and you get a, a description editor. And in this case, you know, we have a left side that has, again, basic properties. So there is sort of a, a name, a text description, description types, a variety of properties there. And then on the right side of this description, then there are tabs that are a series of different kinds of properties that are described for that unit, metamorphic grade, composition, outcrop character, the age of the unit. And different sorts of description schemes could be defined for different kinds of units. So a superficial geologic unit has a different set of properties that you want to describe than, let's say, a high-grade metamorphic unit. So you can define different description schemes for those different types. Um, also, in dealing with bringing data in from the field, a lot of times you start out with pretty heterogeneous vocabulary that the, the geologists are using from the field data and you want to map those terms into a more standardized vocabulary. So we developed a tool for mapping from sort of heterogeneous terminology on the left through the standard lithology terms in the middle and then actually building the map unit descriptions using those standard terms so that things would be interoperable. Another thing we tried to do in the system was to have a fairly sophisticated tracking, data tracking, or now we would call it provenance, but the idea that there are tracking records associated with every feature and observation that document who did it, what project were they working on, are there citations for it, what were the processing methods. So the, there's an activity that's sort of a, a tuple that involves a person in the context of an organization and a project. And then each provenance event then might have a processing method associated with it, which, which might be a series of steps. Um, and this is sort of built on the, the representation of what's called lineage in ISO 19115, if you're familiar with that. It's kind of the same model. What happened over time is that the, the detailing out the individual processing, processing steps turned out to be not worth the effort in general, and, and that was simplified so that we ended up with a, with a form that looked more like this, where there was just a, a name for the tracking event, a comment, the processing method just becomes a text description, and then you can still have citations. So the citations in this case are, were used in the case where you were compiling geologic data from published sources. So on a, in a compilation geologic map, you might have different parts of the map that are coming from different sources. So each feature might actually want to cite back to a particular source. So takeaways from this. This was... a. Uh, in about 2009 or so, you know, the project was sort of abandoned and there were a variety of different reasons. Um, first of all, as you can see from looking at the forms, we've got a fair, it's a very complicated and sophisticated system. So in order to get it to be used, required it would require a major investment in training for people to understand the paradigm and the vocabularies and how to use the forms. Um, it provides, the system provided a lot of tools to create extremely rich geologic data sets, but the downside was there weren't any tools to actually use all this rich data. So the net effect was users didn't see any immediate benefit from all the effort required to learn the system and to actually populate information. Um, there wasn't, you know, there wasn't a motivation there to actually use it. Um, Developing the software from scratch requires a deep resource pool. It was uh, this was probably a grand total of on the order of four or five years, man year or person years of effort to got, get to the point where we were, and we were still at the point where there was an awful lot of effort that was remaining that would have been the 
training and marketing and going out to the individual agencies and, and geologists that we that would be using the system and doing the training and showing them how to use it and improving the tools. Obviously, the user interfaces could use could be improved. So the big chat, one of the you know, takeaways from this was also that in terms of scoping the project, we had lots of meetings with groups of geologists who talked about all the things they want they were interested in. And you know, each geologist in a research environment is looking at various kinds of edge cases, lots of different things. And so the scope became extremely broad, which required this extremely generalized design, which was complex and ended up being not very usable. And so um, basically the, the, the effort was shelved as far as a national geologic map database platform. Um, evolving from that though, at the Arizona survey, we tried, we developed a set of tools to use that database design for generating the maps at the geologic survey. And this was done by, in the ArcGIS environment, because that was the software we were using, is developing an ArcGIS extension. So this was, this was implemented um, in, well, in Visual Basic and also in C um, in the Arc objects environment. And so what we had was an extension that the geologists would add to their ArcMap project which would then provide them with a series of tools for recording the provenance, the, getting the tracking record in there. They could digitize their strike and dip data, digitize the structure data, um, construct the map legend from their map unit descriptions, um, and enter their observation data from individual stations. So each one of these workflows had an associated set of forms. So um, building the geologic unit descriptions, you have a whole set of classifiers from the field that you come in with, with your field descriptions, and you want to aggregate those. You have the station data with um, individual stations on the left. So this was, at this point, the stations were being located with GPS, but they were still, um, the, the notes were being, are being manually recorded on paper and then transcribed. So the idea here was this is the tools to bring the transcription, transcribed notes into a structured form, and then building up the map units for the display on the map with the colors associated with them and the descriptions for the map unit color from all the little observation descriptions at the outcrops. So there was a tool for building, building up those. So this was all developed and, and tested. Um, we had a, a project we did with the National Forest Service compiling a geologic map database that integrated 37 and a half minute quads. Um, it was a very pretty, took a year and a half to do. The compilation map had 400 units in the end. There were about 100,000 line features in the database, 31,000 polygons or so. What we discovered was that, again, we were dealing with this complex database structure with a lot of relationships in there. And with the technology at hand we had at that point, the performance was not acceptable. It was just too slow to open the project up to pan and zoom to select features, to do the editing. So all the tools and everything were there, but the performance was not was just not workable. So what evolved from that then, well, there was a couple things that happened. First of all, Esri went from um, ArcGIS 8 to ArcGIS 9. They changed their development environment from, um, they changed the Arc Objects model. Um, so we ha basically had to rewrite the tools in order to make it work with a new version. And at that point, what happened was two, a couple of things. First of all, the data model got simplified dramatically in, into this new model that we're calling, that's now called the National Cooperative Geologic Mapping Program 2009 model, NCGMP09. Um, so it's a simpler data model that does that only tries to account for the information on one map. And only the, the toolbar, the new toolbar was designed only to deal with the basic functionality that we found that people were actually using. Um, so, so that evolved in the, in the rewrite of the software for the new version of ArcGIS, and this is still in use at ArcGIS, I mean at the Arizona survey for the map production. The code is in GitHub. Um, we tried to promote its use by other surveys, but again, it was a situation where people um, have a workflow set up that they're using and they have to have a pretty strong motivation to learn to use new tools. Um, and there weren't resources to do the necessary training and develop 
the tutorials and documentation. So there was a there's a big activation barrier to moving new tools into the user environment. Um, following on that was the the, the um, U.S. Geoscience Information Network, called we refer to as USGIN, was funded um, through the National Science Foundation, and the idea here was to build on this work to streamline data discovery and access from the geologic surveys, both the state surveys and the federal surveys. And, and the, uh, the goal here was to develop standardized approach to the metadata description for the surveys, work with the surveys to aggregate metadata describing the resources, and also work on standardizing interchange formats and service protocols for the data delivery um, for in order to be able to integrate data more effectively by the users. And the, the bottom line here is that means more work for the data provider, but it means less work for the consumer. And uh, I mean, in an academic environment, that probably wouldn't fly. But remember, this was we were working in a geologic survey environment here where the, the objective was to get the data to the users and make it easy. So the idea was that okay, the surveys should do, can do some more work to make it easier to get the data out there. So for this catalog project, we, we investigated various open source projects um, that would be used to aggregate metadata and develop search, the search, the tools for searching the metadata and also service interfaces for accessing the metadata. So the first thing we worked with was a, a tool called Degree. It's still out there. Um, it's a fairly flexible platform for implementing open geospatial consortium web services, including the catalog service, which is what we were using, but also the web map service, web feature service. The basic problem here was it, it provided a platform for implementing the services, but didn't have any user interface tools at that point. And we, we thought what, you know, developing the user interface would be challenging. So the next thing we, we moved from that to GeoNetwork open source, which is another um, sort of long lived metadata catalog search application that it has evolved over the years since and in fairly significantly is still around um, and is you know currently a really good tool a lot of people are using it what we discovered when we tried using it was that the the code base was a rat's nest um, it was an open source project that was probably five or six years old at that point and trying to understand what was going on in the code was extremely challenging it was a java based application and since we couldn't we couldn't figure out how to customize and, and configure things, we ended up abandoning that and moved to to um, the Esri GeoPortal, which had started out as a commercial product from Esri, but had been open source moved into uh, open source in 2009, and this included both the, the search application using Solar, the search the search um, indexing was done through Solar, and it also had a, a fairly decent user interface for, for doing searches and for getting results and implemented the catalog service. So we, were, we used GeoPortal, we're still using GeoPortal, we've actually used it at AIDA to implement an integrated catalog there. Um, it has continued to evolve with uh, mostly supported by development from Esri, but it is on GitHub and the code is out there for people to, to look at and use. Um, in the next phase, I'll talk about the National Geothermal Data System next, but what happened is, is uh, as we started this, this uh, next system project, we moved to using CCAN, and there were a couple motivations for that. I mean, it's a much, there was a larger user community. There was the CCAN is another catalog and data discovery system, but it was, it's been, it was adopted by data.gov. And since we were doing the project in, um, in the context of the Department of Energy, there was a strong motivation to use the same kind of software that data.gov was using. It also provided some additional functionality for, for previewing data and doing data uploads. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about what we did with CCAN there, but, but currently um, GeoPortal and CCAN are the two platforms that, um, that I'm involved with that we're using for these catalog services. Takeaways from this, this work, um, well, moving from one, open source project to another is costly. It takes time to figure out how a new platform works. Um, in my experience, developers generally don't like trying to figure out how other people's code works, particularly if it's a rat's nest and not very well documented, but even if it is well documented, um, 
people, you know, there's that sort of NIMBY kind of factor. Um, but really, in, in the end, the, the content quality is more important than the platform, um, really, for these discovery systems. And this, this continues to be a problem, is that no matter how good your search index is and your search tools and your user interface, if the metadata quality is bad, you don't get good results and users generally don't come away satisfied. But the upside is that good metadata really only needs to be created once, as long as you have an interchange format. So as we migrated between these different systems, we were able to base to continue to migrate the metadata along with it. We didn't have to recreate the content that we had because we could just move it along using the ISO 19139 XML, which is the format we were using as the interchange format for the metadata. So the upside is that good, the good, meta, good metadata doesn't need to keep being recreated over and over again as, as the platforms evolve for indexing and aggregating and searching the metadata. So the next project was this National Geothermal Data System. And, and this was a sort of interesting, um, what's that? ISO for the win. Um, anyway. Sorry, I just thought it was a good, good remark you just did there. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. So this was, a, this was a, an interesting pr project. It came as a result mostly of the Recovery Act. And uh, there was a lot of funding. There was $20 million, but it involved 48 state geologic surveys digitizing data from files and their, their holdings to try and make more data accessible for supporting the geothermal energy industry. This was back when there was more focus on that kind of thing. Um, but the idea was to catalog the data holdings and digitize things to make them accessible. What we were involved, the software development was support tools for, basic, for building the services for data delivery, for creating the metadata for discovery, for supporting um, identifiers to be able to assign URIs on features and observations to make them linkable. So this was the kind of the software work that was done um, in the geothermal system. The, the uh, design paradigm here was focused around data access and we, we were dealing with sort of data, what we thought of as these uh, three tiers of data interoperability. So we started with, there's a lot of unstructured content that we were getting and, and these would be text, images, graphics, all kinds of stuff, but basically unstructured content that a person could look at and make some use of, but really there was not much you could do automation-wise in terms of using the data. The second tier was data that was structured, but was in various kinds of custom formats generated by different sensors or individuals, you know, generate their own spreadsheets, lots of Microsoft Access databases that were developed by individuals with separate different schemas, DBF files, all kinds of random stuff, but structured. So it is it could be processed with a computer in some fashion, but since it wasn't standardized, every every one every data set was its own problem. And then finally, tier three, which is sort of what we were trying to get to, was this idea of, of having structured data in standard schemes and encoding that would be interoperable, that we could deliver by web services or, or in files so that you could get different data from different people or the same data from different, same kind of data from different people in the same format and be able to integrate that easily and move the integration work from the consumer to the provider. So this project had a variety of projects, uh, products that came out of it. Um, there was a whole series of information exchanges with uh, content models for different kinds of data. We had 26 content models that we developed and were populated by various, various of the surveys, depending on what what kind of information they had. Um, there's a, a metadata content model and profile for standardizing the cataloging. Um, there was a, a registry for these information exchanges that made the, the, uh, that accessible. We also built a, a deployable nodes, uh, network node software stack that I'll talk about in a minute um, so that the individual surveys could actually deploy their own catalog nodes if they were interested or their own NGDS nodes if they wanted to publish data themselves. And then we had data that we had compiled not only from the state and federal geologic surveys, but also from the EGI Institute at University of Utah, from Stanford Geothermal Group, from the Oregon Institute of Technology and the SMU Geothermal Group. So it was an academic and 
and state survey data was brought into this system. So this NGDS node that we built was, was had a variety of, of functions that, that implement. First of all, it was a data and resource repository um, that provided a catalog, so a way to index metadata. Um, it implemented web service for searching not just the metadata, but also for data access. And then it provided a user interface for search and discovery of the content in that node, and also for uploading new content on that node. So this was built using CCAN technology, and the components involved, or you see CCAN at the core there, so the, the sort of lilac colored boxes here are the free open source components that we're using. So there was CCAN, the <coughs> GeoServer for implementing the web services, PostGIS was our database, Solar we were using for indexing. But then on top of that, we developed a series of extensions for deploying the OGC services from the CCAN data store, <coughs> also the um, data upload manager, the integration with the content models in order to provide the standardized services, and also improving the metadata handling within CCAN. It's it, the out-of-the-box metadata model used by CCAN is sort of a Dublin core, slightly extended. So we wanted to build that up to be able to handle a, a more complete ISO 19115 type metadata model. And then also building user interfaces for <coughs> for people to interact with the system. And that was largely implemented using Drupal. So there's a lot of moving parts here. The work was done by developers at the Arizona Survey, but we also subcontracted with Siemens um, because this is a rel you know, relative much higher budget than most of the other projects. We actually had resources to subcontract some of the software development. And, uh, and that was sort of a mixed blessing. One of the big problems we had is they kept changing the developers who were working on the project and we were dealing with a pretty complicated stack here and that the learning curve to get up to speed in order to start being able to contribute was was fairly onerous so when they would switch developers there would be a big lull and and the overall productivity working through the subcontract was ended up being disappointing i should say um a couple of important parts of this were this the uri redirector so that we could assign URIs both on all of the features and observations within the system and have those dereference to provide XML representations. So essentially this is implementing linked open data to be able to access the resources in the system. Um, <coughs> this is fairly early days and, and it's, it'll, we use Django to implement this and it's uh, Right, if we were going to do it again, we'd probably just build it on the handle system. But at that point, the handle system wasn't, there were some problems with using that. Um, we needed a, a pattern-based rewrites in order to make it practical. The information exchange registry is still running and has this collection of definitions um, so that you can get descriptions of these content models as Excel workbooks and XML schemas. There's a JSON representation, links to example instances. And so this provided the framework for these interoperable data services that were all designed to be relatively simple flat file formats. That was another takeaway from the, all the previous work was these interchange formats needed to be relatively simple and focused on particular kinds of content. Um, so NG did, the NGDS is still operating. Um, there's the, the website here, searchgeothermaldata.org. Um, you can go in there and this is a, if you're familiar, this is the standard CCAN interface with some customization. If you conduct a search, um, this is a data set from one of the state surveys from West Virginia. It's the wells in West Virginia, and it's accessible through a variety of different distributions. So there's a web map service, an OGC web map service, feature service. Um, you, can, you can subscribe to an RSS feed to get notifications about updates to the services. You can also just download a file containing the content. <coughs> you can explore, you can actually connect to the service through that user interface and see a tabular view of the data. And you'll notice that the uh, observations and the header, the features and observations here have URIs that are actionable. You can actually um, click on those and what you get would be this XML representation of the content for that, for that feature or observation. 
um, using one of our standard interchange formats. The other thing that CCAN provided was the ability to do some basic graphing of the data. If the, if the uh, tabular data was in a, had content that was amenable to representing in various, uh, either on a map or in a graph, you could generate some visualizations of the data from the tool. So, um, so that's still working and, and we're still working on maintaining that. So takeaways from this project was that con contracting out software development is extremely tricky. Um, you basically have to have a very clear definition of what needs to be done. But, but not only that, you need to be working with somebody who's going to have a consistent team of developers working on the project because changing, changing developers um, causes problems. It, it really sets you back. And that book goes both for, you know, in a subcontract, but also, you know, in a given agency, losing, as we all know, losing developers is, is always a problem. The um, other challenge here was that adoption requires significant marketing efforts. So we had a fairly, you know, we had a budget for doing a lot of marketing. We did presentations at a lot of the geothermal conferences and a, and a fair amount of effort, but it still resulted in, you know, it's, was a, it's a long slog to get the word out there about a new resource that's available. The other thing um, that was missing was the ability to collect better analytics, to collect good analytics and you know, instrument the applications to actually know what was being used and to be able to focus functionality on the parts of the application that were being used. Um, that was a missing piece. And in the long run, at this point, the, the question still remains, of, you know, what's the business model to keep a system like this going? Um, it's public domain data. We can't really charge people to get it. Um, there really isn't any way to support it except through something like a granting kind of operation, or it has to become part of the institutional support from the agencies that are running the system, something like keeping a library or something like that. But that, that problem is still not solved. And, and the net effect of that is the, this, the, uh, the system is languishing. So moving from there, what next? Um, and I guess uh, now it's sort of my own perspective on where I see things heading. And, and really, I think we've gone from these large integrated systems like you know the the original versions of, of geoportal and geonetwork open source and ccan and all these systems were extremely complex platforms with a lot of moving parts and what's been happening over the last several years is these the the the, the projects working on these systems are starting to modularize those parts and separate them out so now for instance in the geoportal the search application and the harvest application are separate components that work together, but they're separate applications. So this modularization and separation of the concerns for the user interface, the actual data processing, the storage are <coughs> being separated and linked um, via network protocols. And HTTP, of course, is the most popular um, using the basic HTTP verbs to move resources around between the various functional components. And the critical thing here is, is standardizing the interchange format. So how do we represent these resources that are moving between the various components? So we have modular, modularized with individual components for specific functions and resource oriented so that they have a collection of resources that we're interested in working with that we're representing in a standard set of simple interchange formats and moving them between these various functional components so that the components can evolve independently. So thinking about the user interface, what are the sort of factors that are, that are important in the user interface components? Well, in terms of getting adoption, it's really important. I think, you know, one of the reasons applications like Windows are popularized is that there was a sort of standard set of user interface components that people got used to working with, which meant it was easier to learn new software because they were using interface elements they were familiar with. Um, another really important factor, and I think, again, this is something that hurt us in all of these projects, or well, in, at least in the NGNDB and, and in the, the uh, geothermal system, was the there really needs to be continuous interaction with specific sets of users that you're targeting, not, not in a you know, sort of abstract sort of way, but have particular people that you're working with who are going to be your early adopters 
and to be testing with those people continuously, does the interface work? Do you under, you know, is it understandable? Can you make sense of it? But the other problem, of course, is that if you get 10 people to look at an interface, you'll get, you know, eight different opinions about what's good and what's not good. So you can't make everyone happy. And that's where the, that's where the art comes in. Um, the user interface components, really the extent of the processing they, they need to do is to produce valid interchange format documents so the user interface is designed to work with some particular kind of resource. It needs to be able to generate a representation of that resource to send to the next component in the pipeline. But these interfaces are really where the import, input from the science users is critical. Um, and I think you know, this is always a challenge as well, is, is how, do, how do the we as technologists interact with the, the science users that we want to work with? And, and sometimes, you know, the science user gets involved in database design when really the, the critical thing to me is that you know the user has to be able to work with the user interface it has to make their life easier it has to get their work done and how that happens really shouldn't be a concern of the end user really that's that's kind of where the technology comes in that's what i would argue the interchange formats are a critical piece in this puzzle and there's been you know a lot of ongoing work in this realm um, they need to be agnostic about operating systems and software. Um, simple text-based formats are, are nice because they work um, on almost any kind of platform. One, um, I didn't talk about it much, but I've been involved both with the development of the XML interchange formats for ISO 19115 metadata and also GSIML. And I think in both cases, um, one of the problems that these, you know, these interchange schemes that have been developed are extremely complicated. They, again, this, they try to scope them. It's, the scope is too big. You end up with something that's too complicated to use. In the geothermal system, when we backed off to using these simple flat file formats, kind of, you know, which has now evolved into the CSV um, data for the web kind of approaches, the idea of simple formats, very granular, designed for specific kinds of information and specific applications. But in order to be interoperable in a larger sense, these have to be designed in some kind of shared conceptual framework. So I think there's still a role for developing kind of conceptual models for the domains we're working in and trying to have those information models shared by, a, by all the people who are working on these interchange formats and components. And this might be you know, something that in EarthCube, for instance, you know, there should be some kind of conceptual framework that people are using as a background that doesn't dictate any kind of database design or actual interchange format implementation. It just defines the concepts that you are going to implement in those things. One of the other important aspects of interchange formats, and, and I think one of the reasons people don't like XML is, is there needs to be an open world capability. People always want to add additional things in stuff. So, so the interchange formats have to be flexible enough that users can add application specific content that maybe nobody else is going to understand but but their group and the people they're working with but that but they have to be extensible like that in a fairly simple way so so the instance documents for these interchange formats have to have to self identify in some way. so when you open when you look at one of these interchange format documents like when you open an xml document you see the the namespace for the XML schema, there's a namespace, and that defines the syntax that's being used. But for interoperability, interchange formats also have to declare what vocabularies are being used. And if you have this open world kind of environment where people might be adding their own additional content, there have to be sort of identifiable validation rule sets so that you can say, okay, this instance document conforms to these validation rules. There might be other stuff in there but at least conforms to some subset of those rules so that if you have an application, you can test and see, will this interchange content work with my application? So, so to me, the interchange formats are kind of a critical point where we need com community engagement and building. As far as the processing goes, um, this is where it's really heterogeneous. Um, the interchange formats just have to get mapped into data structures that are efficient for the kinds of data processing that are going on. Typically, there might need to be some deeper validation that happens with, with the, the content that comes into the processors. 
And the critical thing from the science user point of view is the results of the processing have to be trustable. And this is again where there's inter interaction with the science users is critical to actually determine, yes, you know, this processing component is doing what it's supposed to do. The results are valid, they're accurate. There aren't flaws in the algorithms. So those are some considerations there. Just a quick example of this kind of thinking. Um, let's imagine we have some kind of user interface component, let's say in a metadata editor. Um, user is typing in a description of some resource, you, but you want to geo-reference that resource and they don't, have a, they don't have coordinates for it. So you might have a geo-referencer processing component and the resource that goes from the user interface for the processor is just text. It's just a blob of text that the user has entered describing the resource goes to the georeferencer. The georeferencer analyzes that and sends back a location resource, which is some kind of representation of geographic locations then that the user interface component can use to maybe put a box in a map or something like that that the user can validate. So this would just be a, you know, a where is it service kind of example. Just some, so, so wrapping up, um, the science software market is uh, has you know is is different from the larger scale kind of business markets. We we are, we're constantly we deal with a small number of users, and I think that's that's one of the things that makes business models tricky. Um, scientists are very interested in edge cases, right? They're doing research. They're always trying to push the envelope. So coming up with shared software functionality is is pretty tricky. I mean, you have to define, well, really, what are the common requirements across a variety of different interests for the, the customers you're trying to address? The other issue is that because we're dealing with small numbers of users, it's a research environment, typically grant-funded, money is always tight. And in general, expedience is gonna trump elegance. Getting something that works, that does what somebody needs to do um, is almost always how things get done. Um, it's really important to be aware of the effort required to get users to adopt new tools. A lot of um, unsuccessful projects, I think, kind of evolve because it's not really a software development project, it's a social engineering project, right? You're trying to get users to change how they do things, how they think about their data, how they document their data, um, the way they deliver their data. So getting users to adopt new tools and approaches requires motivating the users in some fashion. And in some cases, again, looking at some geologic surveys in other countries, like in the, in, uh, the, the British Geologic Survey in Australia, there's sort of been, there can be top-down mandates for management that you will use these new tools. Um, that's one way that can happen. Um, the other way is to try to make things actually work better so that people want to use them. That's a much harder road to hoe because, um, it's very tricky to do and, and we're dealing with small numbers, lots of interest in edge cases. So it's always something to really think about. Okay, you know, am I, am I doing a social engineering project or a soft software engineering project? And then it's on, you know, from the upside point of view, I mean, what we need to be doing is looking for actually talking to research scientists and, and thinking about, okay, where are the bottlenecks in your existing workflows? that technology can alle alleviate. And to me, the most successful approach, like I think about our, our um, the map toolbar aspect. So it was built inside the environment that the geologists were already using for working with their data. It did some very specific things that they needed to do, and it made it made their life easier, and, and the geologists use it. So that's the, you know, to me, the key thing is really look for those little things that are really going to make life easier for people and, and implement something good for that seems to be a good approach for, for success. And uh, with that, I'll wrap up. Thanks. Back to you, Jim. Are you there, Bruce? I'm here. Well, good. Okay. Any questions or comments? Sorry, I thought I was unmuted. And I was asking <laughs> what was going on. But <laughs> yeah, any questions or yeah, thank you, Bruce. Uh, anyone? This is an extremely, you know, good talk. 
Um, and it, it's a, it can start a conversation that would go on for a long time because yeah. um, it really gets at a lot of the issues people have with having to build something with an economics that doesn't let you control a lot of the key pieces. So you keep looking for things that are already built and then having to deal with those dependencies and, and, uh, and the effect of those on not, not just development, but on the life cycle of what you produce. And, um, so it's, a, a so, result. yeah, Steve. Yeah. So I have a lot of years of doing uh, building software that people use. In fact, I can't die <laughs> type thing. Right. <laughs> what I'm gonna do. Right. So, well, so, yes, uh, I'm kind of preaching but, to the choir here, I think. But, but uh, my approach has been, it just fell into this, more, much more organic. I have no notion of convincing somebody to use a new tool. Rather, I, uh, I sort of build the tools uh, to accommodate what they're doing. And uh, no matter what it is or how clunky it seems, just accommodate it so people are feel at ease. And under the hood, you can do whatever you want, efficiency-wise, right? But if they are feeling at ease that you're uh, providing a tool that's that's helping them in a way that they suggested, then you have a much better chance of success. But this goes hand in hand with another issue, which is that there's this notion that you can build some super thing that is going to serve a lot of people is uh, probably a dead end, right? As you just sort of described it, all these things are languishing now, right. and so I sort of think of a more organic system where you're building these smaller things that do work that people want. And they don't have to be talked into using and they're willing to support. And then even this is, even works for the interchanges, right? So they just let them grow organically as they somebody wants to interchange data with somebody else and it's a two-way street, then you something develops there to allow that. Uh, but coming down from on high is people just resist. Right. And, and plus it's a hell of a lot of work to wrap your head around it's super complicated so i'm just saying i'm just saying from my experience i am advocating for a bottom up uh keep it simple keep it uh narrow uh domain specific solutions and uh, the bigger picture will come together eventually so yes. I mean, you, it's a great talk a great experience but i'm just saying that's my takeaway right it's like it sort of validates what i'm my experience is right. i've had some pretty and, uh, you know i yeah that's i certainly agree with you there and i just you know speaking from from my own personal experience i know when i started out doing this i you know and i think this is not unusual i had sort of grand visions of all the things that could be done right and a lot of times i think people get carried away by that and end up going down these rabbit holes um and so if there's one thing that you know would be good to try to uh, hopefully the the reason for doing this and reiterating this message again is, you know, don't go down the rabbit holes, follow the, I think what you just said is start small and look for specific things that people can actually use or will are, you know, are doing, but you, they could be doing more easily. Right. From a sustainability perspective, you mentioned, you know, various of these projects, you collected all kinds of metadata and, and databases and blah, blah, blah. Is that stuff just gone stale, gone away, or is it, is well, it a resource? The one advantage, I mean, in these catalog systems, like I said, that you know, the the one redeeming factor is is that once you create, if you create good metadata, and you have a way to extract it from your old system, you can migrate it to the new system. Um, and yeah, so, but what, now, what I'm saying is, where does the where do the it, the metadata is describing artifacts? Where, where they is are the money, money, where's the money right. coming from to store the artifacts? <laughs> yeah, right, right. That's the yeah, right. <laughs> That's the harder problem. And, you know, the other thing, of course, well, in the geothermal system that we're constantly dealing with is that, you know, people change the change the uh, IP or the URLs for their servers and don't <laughs> that and update their metadata, you know, and you end up with thousands of dead links, you know, because the data is still there. It's just got a different URL, you know. And so, yeah, there's I mean, well, you know, and you know, the only solution for that, I mean, well, there's a variety of things. That's where one, you know, the monitoring is one thing that needs to be built into these systems to at least identify dead links. But that's a whole nother, whole nother problem. The, uh, I have this image of speaking with this guy, Jim Gray, who used to work for Microsoft Research, and uh, he came to Georgia Tech and gave a talk about, he was looking for researchers to help him with his river of data project, which basically was, 
uh, trying to find a way to visualize and maneuver around in all of the terabytes of data that that's in the open, uh, you know, uh, uh, open source data coming from telescopes. Right. And and uh, this he had this notion of that there must be some way to use AI and the various things to kind of just discover what's there without putting a big, uh, you know, an onerous task onto users. Uh, and so that might be, you know, you talk about uh, URLs gone missing or chains or whatnot, but it is possible to scan, uh, you know, scan servers and find things. And uh, we do have self-driving cars. That's got to be insanely uh, similar in a way, right, to right. dealing with stuff that's not standard, right, uh, and providing a safe experience. So I, I'm just kind of rambling on here, but right. uh, you know, right. maybe the, the answers are in, in some kind of super adaptive uh, solution as opposed to prescriptive. Right. Well, I know that one of that's one of the things that was at the G cube project in earth cube was working on trying to develop, um, bots to go out and, and scrape things on the, you know, discover stuff on the internet. Um, but I think one of the big problems they ran into there was that, that, you know, as far as, uh, these, I mean, the one example I can think of is dealing with the OGC services. They have a self, there's a service self description document, the get capabilities document. And one of the ways you can, you know, you identify a service, you ask for the capabilities document that should tell you what it does. But what, <laughs> what they discovered was that, you know, most of the services they found the capabilities document were just the default values out of the box that they hadn't, that the people who deployed the service hadn't taken the time with the metadata for the service self description in there to make it useful and yeah for discovery yeah or for that automated discovery stuff it's still that you know if the information isn't there to begin with no amount of cleverness is going to be able to extract it yeah but then you know the, i come back to this notion also if you have a, a scientist or a group of scientists or a couple of labs or labs that want to work with another lab's data or something right find a way to specifically solve that problem and then mm -hmm. learn from, learn from that. It might be right. another approach. Right. So, um, all right, we were into over an hour here, 50, uh, 65, 63 minutes. Does anyone else have, uh, a comment or a question? Okay. So, uh, Steve, that was a, uh, her, her Herculean effort. Especially since it sounds like you have the flu or something. Oh, I've and, got a head cold for several days here. And uh, I learned a lot. It's really it was a good, very well done talk, and with lots of information and and good flow. And uh, uh, I think it'll give everyone something to think about. I'm now I'm just thinking out loud about how uh, we might in this cluster uh, have meetings where we can um, ask people to look at these videos and then come back and talk about them, uh, you know, compare and contrast or something, but we're up against this problem that very few people actually attend and uh, people right. are going off and watching these, but we don't have any way to get feedback. So it's just some looking for ideas for how we might get some feedback for you and for the other speakers. Is this well, something we could do at the, one of the meetings, you know, at, at the summer or winter meeting, just have a session of, you know, reviewing highlights from the, from the presentations? Oh, that's an idea. That's a great idea. Would require somebody, you know, somebody to go through the presentations and try to maybe extract out, you know, sort of, you know, some good conversation starting stuff. Yeah. You could flash on instead of watching the whole hour long video. Yeah. We, so, I mean, you could go with the abstract and the conclusions kind of thing and, and uh, you know, maybe a couple snippets and, and the, uh, and uh, if you had a number of those, that would be a good way to start a conversation that was uh, maybe seated also with a some kind of agenda. Yeah, that might be interesting. Right. Yeah, I think what would be nice, I mean, you know, I really appreciated Steve's talk because I think we, we, we need to continue using, you know, experiences um, of mistakes and, and challenges. Um, to to do better in the future uh and and therefore you know identifying from these talks some critical 
uh, topics to be discussed at the meetings would be really good. I sent you, um, Jim, actually a, a brief email um, suggesting another topic uh, that that is close to my heart, and that's the difficulty of, of rebuilding legacy software. Yeah, um, I actually, I have a whole lecture that I, I mean, a whole section right. I I mean, my, my software engineering class on this, right? It's a big, it's a huge. Oh, I'd love to hear that, you know, because we have been struggling, and Steve knows well about this because he has been involved in this over the last two years. Our efforts to to kind of rebuild and improve the PetDB database, and when you have something in production and you know limited resources, and you need to rebuild something from scratch, it's uh, you know a long process, and it's. It's been specifically challenging to uh, communicate the um, the scope of something like this to NSF, you know, or funding agencies yeah. in general, of how much effort and how many resources you need. It's not just taking this and uh, you know waving a magic wand and it's suddenly a new system, right? Yeah, there's all kinds of uh, academic research and industrial research that's been done on this and different ways to approach it. So. And I think we, yeah, I think that it would really nice to have, in, you know, more resources for our science software community uh, to to take advantage of these lessons learned uh, or you know um, guidelines or whatever how to to deal with legacy software and how to get out of it. So it's just a topic I would like to, to propose. Okay, great. Um, thanks, Kirsten. And I will put, I will, I just jotted down some notes. I'll put some in the summary here also. Uh, and uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll probably send out an email, get asking for some more ideas around this as well. Um, but I think that your, uh, Steve, your suggestion about doing it at the meeting might be a good way to, to have attendance in any case, right? Right. Yeah. And, and can, how does that, I Bruce, how does that work? Slides too? Just the slides? Um, well, that's it, right. Steve? Sorry, what? Can I get, also get a copy of your slides? Sure, certainly. I'll uh, email that to you. Sure, that'd be great. Okay. Yeah, so uh, we will have the call for sessions opening up in a short while for the summer meeting. You can. Uh, uh, create a breakout on you know uh, lessons learned and and uh, uh, conversations on the you know current state of of science software um, from the talks. Okay, great idea. Um, all right, anyone else? Uh, I like the idea of um, having some sort of a forum or space to provide comments and continue discussion after this. And I don't know, it, I'm not really familiar with YouTube, but is that what you, YouTube offers is kind of this exchange of ideas underneath the uh, the posted video. Um, yeah, we do allow uh, comments. Yeah, so uh, if if the presenter can maybe monitor that for a, a period of time, a short while after the presentation is is uh, provided, and just kind of entertain some of those comments or questions that arise there, maybe that's an option as well. But I, I like the idea of this this breakout session um, exploring. Some of these lessons learned and so forth. I think that's a good idea too. Okay. Um, all right, uh, Colin. Thanks. Yep. Uh, anyone else?